The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to Breach Notification, still the 800-pound gorilla. My name is Carlos Leva. I'm the CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the Hippo Survival Guide. I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. We have about, um, uh, I, I would say at least an hour, maybe an hour and ten minutes of, of material to cover. That material um, is going to get covered fairly quick. We will take questions along the way. We like to keep these more interactive. The slides will be emailed to everybody uh, at, that everybody that registered after the um, after the webinar. We didn't have time to do it um, initially, uh, but Martin will take questions um, as we go, and he'll stop me at appropriate times. And I may just ask him, or, you know, do you have any questions? Queuing up, and then we have formal uh, Q and A at the end. So we're going to cover. Uh, here's the agenda. We're going to cover learning objectives, a little background. I'm going to focus a little bit uh, at the beginning on this concept of big data, whether it's your competitive advantage or worst nightmare. And just like type in ye yes or uh, no if if you've heard the term big data, because it's probably um, it's probably the biggest buzzword in healthcare right now. And I'm going to tie in uh, big data with your HIPAA compliance initiative and try to talk about what it means and specifically what it may mean with respect to breach notification. Um, and so in breach notification, we're going to cover when is it triggered, how do you notify stakeholders, and what do you got to do to track security incidents so you can figure out if there's been a breach. Uh, talk about the cost of noncompliance and provide an omnibus rule summary so that um, you folks that haven't kind of gotten caught up as to what the omnibus rule did uh, to the breach notification rule, we'll talk about that a little bit, uh, and, and then take questions um, regarding all of it. So the learning objectives. Carlos, yes. uh, let me interrupt for a minute. You asked a question about big data. I have a yes. bunch of folks that say no, they don't know what, what that is. So maybe we should. Well, we're going to get into that. That's the first part okay. of the presentation. So that is part of this is going to answer that question, what big data is. Um, what we're going to cover today and what, what, what we hope to take away for you is uh, an argument as to why PHI data breaches will continue to accelerate. So again, why breach notification, the breach notification rule under the High Tech Act will remain the 800-pound gorilla. I get a lot of people asking me, you know, what, how can we get this message across to, you know, practices that, you know, don't really think that the world has changed and they're sort of, you know, um, are following the ostrich strategy, just sticking their head in the sand. And here's the thing, you're far more likely to have a data breach that's going to cost you millions of dollars and hurt your reputation than you are um, to get audited. And the other way you can get HHS's attention um, is by a complaint. Any patient complaint wherein it looks like it was, th it, it looks like the facts show that the covered entity or the business associate was in willful neglect. For example, Signet not providing copies of 20 patients' records. 20 patients requested records, Signet, Signet refused to provide the PHI, and they get whacked with a $4.3 million fine. So you're by far likely to experience a breach or a, a, a patient complaint that will draw attention uh, versus uh, being audited. First of all, the, the audits haven't started yet. They're going to start sometime in 2014. And second of all, uh, the methodology that the, uh, of selection is probably going to be something like the IRS. It's going to be random. So, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, uh, the probability is low, but the probability is high of, of uh, why you might experience a breach. And it may even be higher why a patient may complain if you don't give them uh, their access to their PHI or an accounting for disclosure and things like that when you're supposed to and they actually file a complaint. So, well, here we're talking about big data and breach notification and why it's the 800-pound gorilla. We will talk about specific methods by which notification must be carried out, uh, processes and tracking mechanisms that must be instituted in order to manage security incidents. So if I'm an auditor and I show up and I ask this question, tell me how you manage security incidents, how you manage the reporting of security incidents, where you log it, how you track it, how you document it. And if 
you can't answer any of those questions just right off the bat. If you're not tracking security incidents, if there's no way, no, no way for uh, people in your organization to report it, you're probably in willful neglect. The audit's probably over. I mean, you know, as far as the security rule, is how, how can you report a breach if you're not tracking it? Um, we're going to talk a little bit about cost and risk related to PHI data breaches that are off the charts. Steps for mitigating PHI data breaches within the reach of all organizations, large and small. There's some common sense things you could do uh, to uh, dramatically reduce your exposure to breach, and a lot of organizations aren't doing it, and we'll talk a little bit about why. So we want to provide organizational stakeholders with a sense of how your breach notification compliance initiative should be implemented going forward. Just a little housekeeping, every Friday now at 3 o'clock Eastern, we do this radio show called Ask Me Anything Fridays. And if you go to this URL, it's store.hipsurvivalguide.news.html, you will always find a registration URL or an announcement that maybe we're not doing it that week, but you will find the registration uh, URL for that week's radio program, and you are free to ask me anything related to HIPAA or high tech. Uh, we do have a mini topic that we cover but you're free to ask any questions that you like. This is our store. If you went out to our store, you would click on newsletter, you would get a, uh, a page like this, and it would show you click here to register for this week's um, AMA radio show. So, and if you're on the HIPAA Survival Guide website, you can go to the store and then go to the newsletter and get it that way. So. Breach notification touches the, all, all three legs of the High Tech Act container stool. The privacy rule, the security rule, and the breach notification rule, they really do all kind of come together uh, under breach notifications for reasons that we're going to talk about today. Um, with respect to the omnibus rule, it went into effect September 23, 2013. It encompasses and encompassed privacy, security, breach notification, and enforcement rules. Uh, I am sure by now all of you have heard of uh, you know, the sweeping import of the omnibus rule. But here's the thing, the omnibus rule is not a rule by itself. It's re really updates to the privacy, security, breach notification, and enforcement rules. That's number one. Most of those rules obviously were already in effect before the omnibus rule. So the omnibus rule simply made some high-tech act final adjustments to these other rules. Okay? And the other rules were already in effect via interim final rules that had probably been in effect about two and a half, three years because HHS uh, drugged their feet so long to get the omnibus rule out. Anytime you see an orange hand in the slides, uh, when you get them later, that's going to be an indication of something that was changed or an example that was provided by the omnibus rule. If I refer to certain pages in the omnibus rule, uh, the omnibus rule when it came out was in this 500-page PDF. It'll be a reference to that 500-page PDF if you want to go read more about um, certain things that were covered. Now, one of obviously many of you don't want to have anything to do with a 500-page PDF, PDF, and I don't blame you. But it's broken down by topic, and HHS went through um, a lot of trouble to answer public comments, answer questions, pose hypotheticals. It really is a, a pretty good learning tool. Um, if you want to dig deeper. So here's the thing. Uh, we're going to answer this question. What is big data? And the other way uh, this is talked about is called the Internet of Things. And from a healthcare perspective, you can imagine this as being all kinds of devices uh, that are um, taking real-time data, maybe uh, blood sugar, uh, cholesterol levels, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all kinds of things, uh, EKG readings, all kinds of things that a patient could read through devices that are attached through the Internet and uh, are accumulating somewhere where a healthcare provider can see this information uh, for an individual and maybe for populations of individual. And it really is, uh, uh, it really is this whole shift to population health that we're talking about where big data is going to play. So. You know, through accountable care organizations and all, all, all the um, uh, payment incentives are changing to uh, wellness and payment, pay for performance instead of fee for service. Really, big data is going to be the thing that uh, providers have to get their minds around because now they have to start treating a population and making the population healthier 
in order to get uh, the, con the kind of compensation they used to get under fee-for-service. So big data e equals potentially world-class analytics. So you can do all kinds of analysis on this data to figure out, for example, how can you prevent the top four diseases uh, from uh, driving 80 percent of the cost. Okay, or how can you prevent, um, we'll, we'll have an example here on, as to a couple of areas where big data has already played a, a role uh, in healthcare. But you can think of big data as business intelligence, you might think of it as uh, data warehousing, I mean, there's all kinds of terms that have been around, but it, it, when we say big data, it's that the scale of the data is terabytes or hundreds of terabytes or thousands of terabytes to do the kind of analysis that was really never possible before. So uh, big data equals pattern recognition. That's the whole idea here is to use the data. And here I'm talking about healthcare data, but big data is used, uh, you know, Google is an example of accumulating big data on search patterns and things like that. You're, what you're looking for is certain patterns in the data that give you insights that that but for this data you could you couldn't you couldn't get right and to be able to visualize this data in various uh, charts and graphs and other uh, visual displays is what makes it a big deal so there's a book out there if anybody's interested it's really kind of like a tabletop or coffee table uh, type book it's called uh, the human face of big data uh, and it's uh, that's where these quotes came from it's a great book if, you, if you're interested in this kind of thing. It, it sort of covers a lot of examples, but here's some quotes. Every century or so, new technology, steam, power, electricity comes along and really sweeps away the old world and creates a new one. And we've seen that, right? The PC did it. Uh, the Internet did it. Now this Internet of Things and big data, everything connecting to everything else, especially with microprocessor-enabled smart devices, and the kinds of applications that will lend itself to in healthcare. Now, today, a street stall in Mumbai can access more information, maps, statistics, academic papers than a U.S. president could only a few decades ago. Right? We are uh, drowning in some ways in information. We crave information the way we crave sex as a species. This is what we're going to be feeding on. This is what's going to drive innovation going forward. Right? So. We crave information down into the synapses of our, our, our brains. It's, uh, and sometimes we're overloaded uh, for it. Now, now, buy it. Now, this is Eric Schmidt is the CEO of Google. And this is a great data point. From the dawn of civilization until 2003, humankind generated five exabytes of data. Now we produce five exabytes every two days. And I bet this quote is a couple years old. So, uh, you know, who knows how many exabytes we're producing half fast. So big data is going to be important to a lot of industries, but it will be in order of magnitude more important to select few, including healthcare. Why? Why is big data going to be so important? Because fee for service, aka disease management, which is really what our healthcare system is, we don't have a healthcare a wellness system, we have a disease management system. Fee for service is really dead or dying as a viable business model. The future of healthcare is really population health, wellness, wellness, and prevention. And in that space, big data plays a huge role. So population health requires big data plus world class analytics. And what that means is an explosion of PHI. Just a lot more PHI moving around than we used to have. Coming from devices going to the CDC, going to uh, other agencies, just being used by, you know, uh, big providers like, like uh, Kaiser Permanente and et cetera, et cetera. You're going to see just a lot more PHI being moved around. So that's the whole deal. That's the whole impact on, on, um, on HIPAA high tech is big data plus interoperability is going to equal more PHI in motion. The more PHI that's in motion, the more likely uh, it's going to be, be we're going to have a data breach. So you're going to have a lot more weak links, more data breaches. So data breaches um, look like they, um, I think we covered this in the next slide, but 
they increased by 138 percent year over year from 2013 to 2012. So we're already seeing an explosion in data breaches, and I think that's only going to grow. So big data is already having a significant impact in healthcare. These are some examples that came from the human face of big data uh, so that were specifically for healthcare. So uh, there was a doctor in in New Jersey uh, who found that one percent of the population in his area was causing 80 percent of the emergency room cost and what he decided to do was to make home visits to these patients to prevent readmissions to give them the treatment at home so they wouldn't uh, have to go back to the ER and it was really through a pattern that he saw in the data that he was able to institute this program that dramatically reduced emergency room costs in that part of New Jersey now if, if, if it works in that part of New Jersey there's probably no reason it can't work in in Tampa and Washington and in Palo Alto etc now probably um, most of you know but maybe maybe some of you don't that uh, you can now have your DNA sequenced for a reasonable amount of money all right uh, there's a company called 23 and me who was started by uh, one of the co-founders of Google his wife and they will take I think for a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars I think it's a hundred dollars you can uh, they'll send you a kit and you can get your DNA sequence now I think the FDA uh, may have put a, a, a stop because they wanted you know they sent them a cease and desist because they wanted more information as to what they were doing but the bottom line is uh, that technology is available today you can go out there and get your own DNA sequence and there's also technology that can capture thousands of data points in real time uh, and so there's this movement out there called the quantified self now most of us don't want to capture thousands of data points but you can see if you've been in healthcare, um, you know for the aging boomer pop population to be able to get real-time information from their home uh, will enable better treatment and better health care for patients so um, Here's another example of big data. Uh, they found a new pattern in EKG data and discovered that three abnormalities in an, in an EKG are correlated with two to three times higher risk of dying from a second heart attack. So if you can look at that pattern and identify those people early on that have the two to three times higher, probably, higher probability of dying, you can obviously take some preventive measures uh, and and hopefully prevent some of those deaths. This was looking at terabytes and terabytes of EKG data before that pattern sort of emerged. So these are just sort of anecdotal evidence right now, but there's enough of them that uh, th that there's no stopping the tsunami of uh, PHI that's going to be evaluated. So it turns out another example here. It turns out that the rhythm of a healthy heartbeat is really not perfectly uniform. And some researchers discovered that a um, uniform, uni, uniform heartbeat in a preemie, preemie uh, in an ICU, a, pre, a premature uh, birth in an ICU, uh, could actually be an indication of uh, infection or disease onset. And you could discover that maybe 20 hour, 24 hours earlier by analyzing the heartbeat and recognizing that, oh, wait a minute this heartbeat just turned from slightly not uniform which is really the right healthy um, rhythm to uniform which indicates that this baby's having a problem and this baby may uh, be getting an infection and that was some research and some work done by IBM so here's the statistic year over year 138 percent increase in PHI data breaches uh, and I think that's only going to grow now, according to the Pon uh, Ponyman Institute, I think that's how you pronounce it, these are the guys that study data breaches, and they put out a report every year, and they've been doing this for the last five, six, seven years. Ninety-four percent of medical institutions said their organizations have been victims of a cyber attack. I don't think that anyone that's been in the healthcare uh, space and the HIPAA high-tech space is really surprised by that number, uh, as high as it is. Um, so compliance is not equal to security. Compliance is a lot more than security, and compliance is really changing, uh, 
you know, from what it was in the past. So, you know, we like to say this is not your daddy's HIPAA any longer. Big data is going to be one of the reasons why this is really, really not your daddy's HIPAA anymore, and that you're going to have to uh, sort of change the way you think about compliance going forward. So an explosion of medical devices from phones to monitoring devices equals order of magnitude more vectors for the bad guys to exploit. Now, this is a little known fact, but most of the exploitation, most of the breaches, first of all, don't happen because of bad guys hacking into your network. They happen because some laptop got lost or stolen or somebody left their phone or, or, or a PC got stolen. They happen more because of some sort of uh, human error than they do because of hacking. But in the, in the hacking space, they're more likely to have your printer hacked, your fax hacked, medical dev monitoring devices hacked. These are easier vectors for the bad guys to exploit to get into your network. So while you're busy trying to secure all the PHI in your, uh, on, on, on the network, on a, on a server, or in your EHR, these guys are finding back doors into these other devices. So you know, an explosion of devices just means a lot more vectors for bad guys uh, to get access to. So that's, that's sort of big data. I'll take some questions about big data because we're going to move on now to talk more about breach, breach notification, et cetera. That was just sort of the intro that this, this um, explosion in data is, is going to continue for the foreseeable future. So Martin, or do we have any questions queued up as far as that goes? Oh, we have nothing on big data at this point. Um, I'm sure we'll get some questions shortly. Okay, so when is breach notification triggered? So for those of you that, uh, that are new to this space, it was all driven by the High Tech Act, and it was High Tech 13402. So in the old HIPAA universe, the breach notification rule did not exist. It was introduced by the High Tech Act, specifically Section 13402. And when you get the slides, you can click on this and you'll get a URL and take you out to the HIPAA Survival Guide site down here at www.hipaa survival guide and you can read the entire uh, section of the statute. And I'm going to quickly go through some of this so that we can get to Q&A and we can get uh, we can answer your questions. You can read the slides later. I'm going to try to hit the high points and there's certain specific things I want you to take away from uh, this set, uh, this session. First of all, you, you only have to notify, and we're going to get to an analytical framework in, 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 in a bit. Noti you only have to notify in the case of a breach of unsecured PHI. That means if you encrypt PHI as was recommended by the secretary uh, through the NIST protocols, then you have a safe harbor and you don't, you can't have a breach by definition. So that's one of the common sense things we're going to talk about that um, more covered entities and BA should be doing. Here's some basics. Covered entities must notify individuals, individuals meaning patients. It's always the covered entity that notifies, okay? Business associates must notify the covered entities. It's always the covered entity's responsibility to notify, notify the patient, media, or HHS, depending on the breach, okay? The notification must be no later than 60 days after discovery. That means no later than 60 days after uh, the BA told you if, if the breach happened in the business associate system that had PHI. Okay, so that's when the clock starts ticking unless, unless the BA is an agent of the covered entity, and that's a whole different thing that, uh, that we need to talk about agency, but if, if the BA is an agent, is, is, is totally controlled by the covered entity, then that clock starts ticking as soon as the BA knows of the breach. Okay? That's a special case. There are specific notification methods that are required depending on the n number of individuals whose PHI was breached. Everybody by now really should have a breach notification plan in place, a breach notification analytical framework that they have. You don't want to start coming up to speed on this when that inevitable breach happens and you get this phone call, somebody lost a laptop with 30,000 records, you know, what do you do? 402, 13402F says, the notification must contain specific content. So the regulate the statute is telling you you got to have X, Y, and Z in the notification. 402H says unsecured PHI it provides the definition for unsecured PHI. It's PHI that's not secured through encryption and or destruction as provided by HHS guidance. And the methods, the NIST protocols, or something better, more more um, 
rigorous, must render the PHI unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals. And I would uh, point you to the NIST standards for the specific protocols. Now, if PHI is secured as per the guidance, then providers have a safe harbor because uh, the notification requirements are not triggered, They're not triggered by uh, definition. What's the definition of a breach? This is the definition of, of a breach, but there are um, many terms of art embedded into this definition that we're going to explore. The, the definition of a breach is the unauthorized acquisition, access, use, or disclosure of PHI, which compromises the security privacy of such information, except when an authorized person to whom such information is disclosed would not be able to retain such information. It's like, what? That's just a bunch of gobbledygook, and so we, we got to break it up to be able to understand what that means. And uh, under 164.402, the definition of breach has been expanded to provide uh, three exceptions, okay? And those exceptions become very important. And I'm going to just introduce this because there's a really uh, uh, large conversation going on uh, on LinkedIn, one of the LinkedIn groups about uh, about this very topic. Um, you know, and here, here's here's sort of the the hypothetical. Not every unauthorized use or disclosure is a breach, okay? And, but the ones that aren't, the only unauthorized uses or disclosures that aren't a breach are those three exceptions that are contained in the definition of breach under 164.402. Those, those exceptions are in the form of hypotheticals. Okay, so if you have an unauthorized use or disclosure and it falls into one of these hypotheticals uh, in the definition of breach, then it's not a breach by definition. But you don't have to look for thousands of hypotheticals or make them up in your head. They give you the hypotheticals. It's these three and only those three. Okay, and what do we mean by unsecured? I mean, a, 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 a unauthorized use or disclosure, that really means a violation of the privacy rule. That's what that means, okay? So uh, there's only three instances that a violation of the privacy rule is not a breach. Now, we're assuming here that the PHI wasn't, wasn't, um, was unsecured. As we already talked about, if it was secured, you don't, uh, you don't have a breach by definition. This graphic just represents the, not the notification scheme. You may have a chain of BAs. Each BA notifies its BA. You know, and then you have the BAs that directly contract with the covered entity, notify the covered entity, and the covered entity has to notify HHS patients and the media where appropriate. Now, we're going to spend, we're going to go through this pretty quick. There's a whole presentation that we do, webinar on business associates, but it's a broad, um, it's a broad de definition, okay, and it, and it includes partners wherein the product or service provided requires the disclosure of protected health information by the covered entity. So accountants, consultants, software vendors, EHR vendors, PHR vendors, you know, the list goes on and on. And what you have to look at is does the BA require on a regular basis access to PHI in order to do perform the business function that it performs on behalf of the covered entity. Now, under the High Tech Act, business associates are now liable and must comply with the, all three of the rules, the privacy rule, the security rule, and uh, the breach notification rule. And there's no such thing, really, as, um, you know, a, a HIPAA light or high-tech light. Uh, there are different ways that different business associates could be compliant. Because if I'm an attorney and I go on site to um, perform a service and I happen to look at PHI on site, that's one thing. Uh, which is totally different from being a business associate that hosts its own uh, PHI, right, for on behalf of the covered entity on the cloud. They're both business associates, and both examples have to comply with the privacy rule, security rule, uh, and the breach notification rule. But their actual implementations are going to be different because the 
the facts surrounding what they do are quite different. But it doesn't mean that you're relieved of the obligation to comply. So BAs are directly liable uh, for um, the privacy rule. They're also liable for any privacy rule provisions that are put into the BA contract. Uh, BAs are not permitted to use or disclose PHI in a way that would be a, private, uh, a violation of the privacy rule if the covered entity did it. But, of course, a BA may, may use PHI for its own management administration, and that's just common sense because otherwise what, you know, the, the BI couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't do its job. Now, here's the thing regarding BAAs and contracts between a BA and a covered entity is a BA becomes a BA by definition, not because there happens to be a BA contract in place. Therefore, li liability attaches immediately. If you're sharing your, P your covered entity and you're sharing your PHI with a BA, that entity is a BA. With a, with a business partner, that entity is a BA. Liability attaches immediately. You better have a contract in place. That BA better be complying with the privacy rules, security rule, uh, et cetera. Now you can have subcontractors or BAs under the omnibus rule, that's the orange hand, subcontractors or business associates are also now business associates, and they must comply with the privacy rule, security rule, etc. And you can have subcontractors of subcontractors all the way down uh, the line. So what are BAs responsible for? They're now directly liable, directly, statutorily liable for impermissible uses and disclosures, failure to provide breach notification, failure to provide access of EPHI in certain cases, failure to disclose PHI to the secretary, failure to provide an accounting of disclosures, which is a topic that we're going to do a webinar on. Uh, look for an announcement in the newsletter, I believe, on about 3.13. We haven't scheduled it yet, but accounting for uh, disclosures is the next sort of monster. That's the one piece of reg uh, regulations that HHS hasn't really finished under the High Tech Act. And failure to comply with the requirements of the security rules. So, BAs and CEs should clearly recognize that we're definitely not in Kansas anymore. This, the HIPAA world has really changed, and here's what's going to happen. There are rules, uh, words, language in the security rule and in the privacy rule that I call weasel words. Like, you know, it says things like, you need to get reasonable and appropriate satisfactory assurances from your business associates that they are complying with the uh, privacy rules, security rule, et cetera, okay? So what does that mean, right? Satisfactory assurances, reasonable and appropriate. Well, you know what? It probably means a lot more than just signing a BA contract. I mean, in our model business associate agreement, we, we uh, make it a requirement that the business associate uh, share its processes, policies, its result tracking with the covered entity or with the other business associates so that the right kind of due diligence is going to take place because you can bet anytime there's a major breach, there's going to be a class. There's also going to be a class action lawsuit, lawsuit under state law, not based on HIPAA or high tech because individuals can't bring those actions, but there'll be a negligence um, under state negligence negligence law, uh, and on the theory of you didn't get satisfactory assurances, you didn't do what was reasonable and appropriate. So BAs now uh, are required to have, um, BA, first of all, BAs must comply with the minimum necessary principle. That, that principle applies to everybody. Business associates are required to have business associate agreements with their subs. BAs must monitor the business associate agreement with their subcontractors. BAs also must monitor the, the contract with the covered entity. These requirements cascade down. So we talked about you can have subs of subs, uh, et cetera. Okay, we've covered this. The takeaway here is that business associates are really uh, on the hook. And if you want to see the different um, kinds of contracts, uh, the specifics that have to be in the contracts, you can go to these various sections. If you're a group health plan, you go to 504F1. Uh, otherwise, you go, uh, most healthcare providers go to 504E1. This is what has to be in your business associate contract. Again, if you click here, you can go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide and get the full text of that. Um, so the privacy rule applies to whom, right? To covered entities and business associates. That's the 
that's the universe. Business associate defined, this is change, but you can think of it as anybody that creates, receives, maintains, or transmits PHI on behalf of a covered, of a, on behalf of a covered entity, that's going to be a business associate. Legal, actuarial, accounting, we've been through the laundry list of who potentially could be. Uh, now, some of them are, some BAs are BAs by definition in the High Tech Act, like uh, health information exchange, an e-prescribing gateway, or other person that provides data transmission services with respect to PHI to a covered entity and that requires access on a routine basis. So there's a distinction being made between a like a uh, health information exchange organization, an HIE, and your ISP, right? And that's the whole conduit. Your ISP is just a conduit. Uh, the High Tech Act has said that, hey, these other providers, these other data transmission services, they're not just conduits. They're, um, they're more than just conduits. They're, and because they're more than just conduits, what they're doing with PHI actually makes them a business associate. <coughs> I'm going to catch a breath here, Martin. Is there any questions uh, queuing up? Yes, we have a bunch of questions. Okay. Did you catch your breath? I have now. Fire away. Okay. If a BA notifies a CE of a breach and the CE does nothing, what are the obligations of the BA? I think if, if the BA has notified within its uh, statutory time frame, then the BA has met its, its, its obligations. The, the burden then shifts to the covered entity. Now, that, uh, doesn't, mean that, that doesn't mean that the BA, I mean, the BA is off the hook from notification. That doesn't mean that the BA is not going to get audited. If the breach happened on system control by the BA and the BA wasn't complying with the security rule, then the BA is potentially open to all kinds of fines into the millions of dollars. But if, if you're just looking at the notification requirement, if the, the BA notified uh, on time, it's not, going to be, it's not going to get whacked for not notifying. The, the, the burden then shifts to the covered entity. Um, in one of the previous slides, we said something about despite safe harbor, other federal regulations apply. What what was the meaning of that? Yeah, there are other uh, specialized um, federal laws that apply to certain government agencies, and you know, there there's uh, I can't rattle them off. Uh, off the top of my head, but it, 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 there are three or four others. The Privacy Act is one, and so, it, you know, the HIPAA high tech is not the universe of federal law that uh, deals with um, sort of, you know, PHI, but it's, for the most part, it's the big gorilla. There are these other laws out there that apply mostly to other government agencies. Okay. We have an interface with QuestLab. I tried to get a BAA from them, and they sent back and stated since they are a covered entity, they did not have to sign a BAA with us. Is that, that is correct? correct? That is correct, yes. Their labs are treated as other covered entities. Covered entities, you know, you don't have to have a, a BAA for the purposes of, uh, um, you know, providing health care. So that's just an extension of... They're another covered entity, just like a specialist would be a covered entity, and you don't need to have a BAA with them. That's correct. Does the BAA have to go into very high detail as to how the BAA may access and or use the PHI? No. no. When you say high detail, I'm like, you know, um, uh, no. The answer is no. You, you do have to describe what uses and disclosures are uh, acceptable for the BA. You have to have some language in there, but it, you don't have to do it at any, at any great level of, uh, of detail. That's not, that's not the purpose. The purpose is to specify, you know, if, you're, if, if you have a BAA with somebody that does your billing, then they're going to use the information for billing and not for anything else, right? But you don't have to get down to what record can be used for you don't have to describe all that now there are things in there are 
sections that you have to have in the BA that are required in the regulations, right? So it's a it's a specific kind of contract. But once you cover those areas, there's nothing special about this contract where you can't put in other terms and conditions that govern the relationship between uh, these two business partners. So after you have the regulatory sections covered, you are free to provide anything that you need to uh, that you otherwise might in any old contract. It really is just a regular contract that has to have uh, some special language in it and the parties are free to provide other terms and conditions as long as you know they're not illegal or, or unconscionable. Okay. How do you monitor a BA? Is it in the contract that we must inform you or is it more hands-on like site visits, scheduled, unscheduled, that sort of thing? No, it's satisfactory assurances that are reasonable and appropriate. <laughs> those are the, those are the we, weasel words. Are you kidding? They're never going to tell you how to do it. You're going to have to figure out what is reasonable and appropriate, and that's probably going to change by business associates. So there's no, first of all, the monitoring is the monitoring, to just to be clear on this point, monitoring doesn't mean monitoring operations of the business associate. Monitoring means the contract, okay? You can't turn a blind a blind eye to what's in the contract, right? And look the other way when you know that a, a business associate is violating a term and condition of the BAA. That's what you have to monitor, okay? And the BA and the BA has to monitor the covered entity as well. So, for example, if you had a a uh, BAA with a billing agent and they were using and, and it, there were terms and conditions that they couldn't use the the PHI for anything but billing and for some reason they started sharing this PHI with a research company and you were aware of it then you can't ignore you have to monitor the contract that would be a material breach of the contract and you would have to um, take the appropriate action so you don't there are no requirements that you have to monitor and obviously it would be an impossibility right with thousands of BAs how are you going to monitor them so Somewhere there's a middle ground where you can make, where you want to get to, where you can make a good faith argument that you did reasonable due diligence, and I'm uh, suggesting to you that it is more than just signing the contract. So you may want to go a little bit deeper than that, like show me your policies, show me, uh, you know, talk to me about certain processes, show me how you track security incidents. You probably maybe have a questionnaire that you want to go through. You probably want to do more due diligence to, than just signing that contract because that's probably not going to be enough to satisfy reasonable and appropriate. This question is uh, along the same lines. There is actually very little guidance on how CEs can gain assurance from BAs that they are doing what they're supposed to do. Do you know any references that may help? auditing, checklists, et cetera? Well, you know, I mean, to cover a, 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 a shameless plug early, you know, at the HIPAA Survival Guide store, we sell a breach notification framework. We sell checklists and templates, that, you know, and we go through the kinds of things that you ought to be doing, to, you know, to at least be able to make a good faith argument that you're getting, you're getting reasonable assurances, and that is, you know, getting access to the other party's policies, procedures, and first of all, if you don't know what you should be doing, you're probably not in a good position to ask what somebody else should be doing, right? So you need to get educated and understand what it is you're required to do, and then ask the right questions and ask for the right kinds of information from the BA that would give you a satisfactory assurance that they are, in fact, doing what they're supposed to be doing. I mean, there's obvious common sense questions that can be asked. When's the last time you train, trained your staff? Oh, we trained everybody right after the omnibus pool. Oh, really? Show me that spreadsheet that you have that, that shows that, that you trained everybody. Show me your training policy. I mean, these are the kinds of questions that are going to give you a, 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 you know, if you get that deer in the headlight look like, you know, oh, my God, you know, I just told this lie that I can't support, then, you know, uh, then there's probably a problem. Now, if you never ask the questions, then obviously you probably didn't do get satisfactory assurances or you're not going to be able to make a good faith argument that you did because you didn't ask the appropriate questions. Now, part of the problem, like I said, is you, you need to get educated and literate enough to know what those questions should be. And then it becomes a lot easier to ask a BA 
uh, what they're doing, how they're handling X, Y, and Z. I'll take one more, and then I'll, I'll move on here, Martin, so that we uh, can Okay. Is the BA obligate, obligated to initiate a business associate agreement if the CE doesn't? Yes. Both parties are obligated. It's not one, it's not, you know, it's not, it's a contract between two parties, right? It's not the CE. I mean, look, it's one contract. And just like any other contracts, the economically dominant partner usually gets to determine, term, you know, dictate terms and conditions. So, right, if you're signing up for Microsoft's Office 365, you're going to sign Microsoft's BAA. That, that's just the way it is, right? But it, it, it is a contract between two parties, and either both parties have a duty to make it happen. It's not simply the covered entity who has that uh, duty. I'm going to move on. We'll take, we'll take more because some of this stuff, frankly, you guys can read about when you uh, read the slides. Okay, so any third party that stores or maintains PHI on behalf of a CE, that's going to be a business associate. That's the definition. It doesn't include your ISP. It doesn't include your wireless service provider. It doesn't include UPS, FedEx, DHL. Why? Because HHS has provided this conduit exception. Okay, and these fall under the conduit exception. Some uh, potential BAs fall under the conduit. Uh, potential partners fall under the uh, conduit exception. Others don't. Uh, and it doesn't include a third party whose con contact with the P uh, PHI is incident to housekeeping, landscaping. Yes, they come in contact with uh, PHI, but you know what they do doesn't really require on a daily basis PHI. So um, these are not business associates. Now quickly, so protected health information is defined broadly. It's individually ident identifiable health information that is transmitted or maintained in any form or medium, paper, electronic, by a CE, or its BA. It's really, really broad. Um, it's built on this information of, on the definition of health information. So if you look at the definitions on HIPAA survival guidance, you have a definition for health information. Then you have a definition for individually identifiable health information that contains health information. Then you have a, a definition of PHI that's built on individually identifiable health information. So one of the things that came out of the omnibus rule is that health information now includes genetic information, okay, oral or recorded in any form or media, right? And this is the definition of health information uh, created or received by a healthcare provider, and that relates to the past, present, or future physical or mental health. Uh, or condition of an individual. It's really, really broad. And then you have this individually identifiable health information that's built on top of, it's a subset of health information, and it's, um, it's information uh, including demographic informa information coll uh, collected from an individual and is created or received by a healthcare provider, health plan, employer, or healthcare clearinghouse that, again, relates to the past, present, future, physical or mental health, payment, etc. It's a really, really broad uh, definition that identifies the individual or with respect to which there is a reasonable basis to believe the information can be used to identify the individual. So PHI means individually identifiable health information except as provided in um, paragraph two here. There are really narrow exceptions that are transmitted. Um, individually identifiable health information is transmitted by electronic media, maintained in electronic media, or transmitted or maintained in any other form or medium, right? Paper, electronic, doesn't matter. It's all PHI. And these are really narrow exceptions. Excludes individually identifiable health information and education records covered by uh, FERPA and, uh, and, and employment records held by a covered entity in its role as an employer uh, and new under the omnibus rule regarding a person who has been deceased for more than 50 years. Now this doesn't mean that you have to keep PHI around for death plus 50. What this means is PHI that is 50 years older past or information, health information, individually identifiable health information that is older than 50 years past the death of an individual is no longer PHI. That's what that means. It's just not PHI anymore by definition. So um, here are the changes that the summary, the, the omnibus rule um, brought 
about. We've already talked about those. You can read about those. Um, and characteristics of PHI, I think, you know, you can read about that. We all more or less know um, what those are. Here are the exceptions uh, to, to what is not PHI. They're really, really narrow. Um, also, if you can, if you de-identify um, individually identifiable health information by removing certain identifiers so that the individual can no longer be identified, that is not PHI. Uh, and, you, you know, you want to remove things like names, dates, social security numbers, uh, geographical data, et cetera. If you get involved in doing de-identification for research purposes or for any other purposes, I, I would encourage you to get professional um, statistical help and not rely on, you know, uh, people that just aren't well versed in de-identifying because you want to make sure that you de-identify correctly or otherwise you're going to be uh, liable for um, an impermissible use or disclosure or breach, et cetera. Now here, here's the important part that you ought to have in place. You, you need to determine when is a breach a breach. And this is the analytical framework out from our breach notification framework uh, product. And the analytical framework is fairly simple. The analysis that you have to do um, to get there is not. It's a, it's a three-question framework. First you ask, was there an impermissible user disclosure of unsecured PHI? And we're going to cover what that means in a second, but it really means, was there a violation of the privacy rule? And, and was the data not secured according to the, the guidance? If the answer is yes, then you, then you ask, does an exception to the breach rule apply? This exception that we're talking about in step two, those are those three exceptions that are built into the definition of breach in 164.402. Those are the only three exceptions. That is the universe of exceptions where you might have an unauthorized use or disclosure. In other words, you might have a violation of the privacy rule that is not a breach. Those are the three exceptions. Don't go looking for others because you're only going to get distracted by something that is not going to help you. That's the universe of exceptions. If an exception doesn't apply, if an exception applies, you're done. Okay, you stop. There's no breach. If an exception doesn't apply, then you have to ask this question. Is there a low probability that the protected health information was compromised? This changed from the interim rule, which was a, a, a risk of harm analysis. That's out the window. This is a risk assessment analysis, and good luck if you get to step three trying to prove there was a low probability. A, because now there's a presumption of breach. There's a presumption that the breach occurred and the covered entity and the business associate had the burden of proof to show that it, that it was a low probability. That is a high burden uh, and I think in very, very few instances is, are you going to be able to actually prove that there was a low probability that the protected health information was not compromised. Any questions here about the framework. Um, breach notification periods. If a BA is responsible for a breach on day or on day one and notifies the CA, does the CE then have, on day sixty? I'm sorry, I had a little trouble following this for a second. On day one, notifies the CE on day sixty. Does the CAE have 60 days to notify patients, HHS, and media? Yes. The answer is yes, unless the BA is an agent of the covered entity. And in most cases, um, these are arm's length business partnerships, and agency won't apply. And we'll get to agency in a second. But yes, that's how it would work. Now, you know, you know the, the idea here is not to wait to day 60. Day 60 is the last frickin' day that you can notify. But yes, you could notify on day 60 and the covered entity would then have 60 days to notify uh, HHS, the media, and patients. To, and uh, HHS, by the way, always gets notified. It's just a question of if it's over 500, does it get notified now or does it get notified at the end of the year, okay? So you can, it, patients and HHS always get notified. HHS depends on when. We're going to cover that. And uh, the media gets notified under special circumstance that we're also going to cover. Um, so uh, another question about the framework. 
Uh, does the method of the breach, for example, theft, have any influence on the fine, or is it just across the board? No, it's not going to have any. You know, it's it, it's kind of like a strict liability standard. It's not going to have any any influence. Somebody stole a laptop that had you know fifty thousand unencrypted records. You know, update your resume, get out of town. That's a two million dollar fine, probably. Who knows, right there? But no, it's not going to matter. It's not. It's not going to matter. There are some limited exceptions where a covered entity, even doing uh, you know reasonable due diligence, wouldn't have known. Uh, and we get to that in the enforcement rule and the tiered penalties, but something like theft, no, it's not going. It's not going to matter. Let me let me move on. Let me try to get through the slides because we have a whole half hour dedicated to Q and A. Um, and but keep in mind, this is the framework. This is what you got to do, and, and we're going to walk through this. The first question has two components: impermiss impermissible use or disclosure, and unsecured PHI. Impermissible use or disclosure means was the privacy rule violated? Unsecured PHI means protected health information that has not been rendered unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to unauthorized individuals through the use of encryption or destruction. What kind of encryption? The one that the Secretary provided uh, in its guidance, and I think it was in the interim, interim breach notification rule uh, where it provided guidance to the NIST protocols of the kind of encryption that you should be using. And the kind of encryption that you're going to be using, here it is. This is the guidance that was provided, okay? And it's going to depend on whether PHI is at rest, in motion, or whether you're disposing of it. And be wary of disposing um, printers and fax machines and these devices that store images, and you didn't even know they stored images, and you gave, you know, you gave your old printer or your old fax to hospice, and now you just, you know, and you, not only did you give them your printer, you gave them 5,000 you know, records of PHI unencrypted. Um, so these are the various documents that you want to refer to uh, that will guide you as to how you should encrypt. What is an impermissible use or disclosure? We already talked about that. It's a violation of the privacy rule. Now, how do you go about thinking through this thing? Well, first of all, we talked about you better have a way to report and log security incidents. If you're not doing that, you're already in willful neglect. One of the questions to ask when you log an incident is, you don't know. Somebody calls up and said something happened with a particular system. A ask the question should be, well, is this one of our systems, which implies that you got an inventory of your systems and you know that contain PHI. If the answer is no, if there's no PHI in that system, well, you might review that that incident for other uh, applicable law, but it's not a breach of PHI. It's not a breach of HIPAA, right? You can, if the answer is yes. Then you want to create an incident document and go on to the breach analysis, right? So that's at 100,000 feet. Just ask the question, does this system contain PHI? Here's an example of our breach document, at least the first page. Is you just want to have a place, once you decide that this incident requires analysis, you want to capture all the information regarding your analysis in one place, um, in, in, in this case, in this example, in a particular kind of document. You want to ask. Remember, we're still on question one. Was the PHI secured? If the PHI was secured, encrypted according to the protocols, there's no breach by definition. Complete the incident document and say, done. Attempted breach on PHI system ABC. All PHI was encrypted. No breach. That's it. That's the end of the analysis. Otherwise, if the PHI wasn't secured, you'd continue to notification analysis. Right? So if it's secured according to the Secretary's guidance, you're never going to have uh, notification will never be triggered by definition, and that's the ultimate breach notification safe harbor. Encrypt, 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 right? That's one of the common sense. Obviously, it's easier said than done, but, you know, why not treat the disease at the root and get at it instead of, you know, doing all this other stuff? Just encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. Now, the security rule suggests but does not mandate the use of encryption, but I got to tell you, today, the security rule also says you should do what is reasonable and appropriate. More and more, encrypting is going to be what is reasonable and appropriate. And, you know, yes, you can be in compliance with the security rule and not encrypt because it's not mandated. But the question you ought to be thinking is, is it reasonable and appropriate? And it really is reasonable and appropriate because that's the one thing that can prevent you from having to ever report a breach. Okay, the practical reality is 
paper is going to be around for a long, long time. Some PHI is going to be encrypted. Other PHI is not going to be encrypted. You should have a table of applications and an inventory of your applications and systems and workflows. You need all that for your risk analysis uh, as, as part of your risk assessment anyway uh, so that you can determine what kind of system is this. Um, here are the various NIST publications. I'm not going to go through these. There's one for PHI at rest, one for PHI in motion, right? And PHI in motion, uh, it's really at this level of the ISO communication stack for you geeks. It's really not, S, not secure sockets, but it's a, a transport um, TLS. I think it's transport layer security that was built on SSL. That's the NIST protocol that you should be using, but anybody... Any, any security professional worth their weight can help you make sure that you have your connections, that your connections are secured or encrypted appropriately. Look for all PHI touch points for lots of different reasons, but for breach notification purposes, you know, you should have an, uh, not only an inventory of your applications, but an inventory of where you are moving or transmitting or receiving uh, PHI. Also, if you're going to dispose of any device that has PHI, you better do it in an appropriate way. Uh, sanitize it. There's NIST publication 8088 goes into uh, detail as to whether you should be clearing, purging, destroying. Just keep in mind that you ought to have a process for decommissioning devices that contain PHI so that you destroy them, uh, destroy the PHI appropriately before uh, you give it to your local hospice. So we're still on question one, right? So was there an impermissible use or disclosure of PHI? That is, was there a violation of the privacy rule? And but if you're asking was the PHI secured, that's not that's not a really that easy a question because you got to figure out, okay, was the PHI that was breached at rest? Was it in motion, etc. Right? It's more complicated because it really the way you encrypted. And the protocol that you have to follow depends on whether it's in motion, at rest, et cetera, right? So the, these flow charts come out of our breach notification framework. It just goes to show you that the analytical framework, those three questions are pretty simple. The actual analysis that you got to do is a lot more complex. Same thing with the privacy rule. Sure, you can say, was, was there a violation of the privacy rule? The question is, how do you determine whether or not the privacy rule was violated? That's where the complexity arises and the way you determine that is you have to go through the general rule and say, well wait a minute, was this disclosed to a patient? If it was disclosed to a patient, you're okay, no breach. Was there a valid authorization? Oh, okay. We disclosed it, but it was about no breach. Disclosed to a legal representative. Okay, so you have to do the right analysis of the privacy rule to determine if there was a breach or a violation of the privacy rule. And let me tell you, if you're going to sanction your employees for violating the privacy rule, you better have a methodology that's going to hold up to a lawsuit as to here's how here's our methodology here's how we go about determining whether or not the privacy rule was violated this is what we did for this particular individual this is why we determined they had violated uh, the privacy rule this is why we sanctioned them here are the three exceptions does a breach exception apply we finally got into step two of the analytical framework you can read them right these are certain fact patterns this is almost verbatim from the definition, under certain conditions, any unintentional acquisition, access, or use of PHI by a workforce member, which is a term of art, or person acting under the authority of a CE or BA, if no further use or disclosure is contemplated. Okay, any unintentional acquisition, access, or use of PHI by a workforce member, somebody controlled or under the authority of CA or BA, if no further use or disclosure, if you're uh, violation falls under that fact pattern, then it falls under one of the exceptions. Exception two, any inadvertent disclosure by a person who is authorized to access PHI at a CE or BA to another person authorized to access PHI at the same covered entity or business associate. And this probably happens, you know, a hundred thousand times a day that one nurse or doctor gives the wrong chart to the wrong person you know, and then gets the chart back because that nurse isn't treating or that doctor is not treating this. But that's not a breach, right? That's just a common sense. If that's what happened, it's not a breach. Notice that these are, this is in the definition. These are the only exceptions. You go through this part of the analysis and you say, 
does my scenario fall under one of these? Number three is a disclosure of PHI where a CE or BA has a good faith belief that an unauthorized person to whom the disclosure was made would not reasonably have, have been able to retain some such information. One of the nice things about that 500-page document is uh, of the omnibus rules, HHS does go through hypotheticals, and you know we use those hypotheticals in our training. You know when we're doing specific kind of training, but you know we're not trying to cover all breach notification training here. We're just trying to go through the analytical framework. But this, an example of this is you gave uh, PHI to a person that you thought was with this other person, uh, and uh, you know before they get 20 feet down the hall. You realize that you gave the PHI to the wrong person. You go if you're a nurse or doctor, and you get it back from that person before they've exited the building, right? Before they even left the floor. Well, you can probably make an argument that they, they wouldn't have reasonably have been able to retain such information because you just gave it to them, and they just walked 50 feet in front of you, and you realize, oh crap, I gave it to the wrong person. I went back and got it, right? Those are the exceptions. Otherwise. If no exceptions apply, you have to show that there's a low probability that the PHI in question was compromised. We've gone from a risk of harm analysis to a risk analysis approach or risk assessment approach. Four factors to be considered. Nature and extent of the PHI involved. Unauthorized person who used the PHI. Was the PHI actually acquired or viewed? Risk to the PHI that has been mitigated. Let me tell you, good luck trying to make this argument. There's a presumption of breach. This is a high burden to uh, make an argument successfully that there was a low probability that it um, was compromised. So the risk of harm analysis is completely gone. Okay, was you know, and it, and you know, the risk of anal harm analysis used to be was there some risk of harm to the individual? The Congress said no, 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 no. HHS, that's not what we intended. You know, that is that gives covered entities too easy a way out. TRICARE tried to use that risk of harm analysis and said, oh, no, nobody got harmed here. They were shot down before the fondness rule ever came out, and it was a big brouhaha. I'll make a long story short. That's gone. Uh, it's not risk of harm to the individual. Now the focus is on whether the PHI itself was compromised. So it's shifted to the PHI and to a risk assessment approach to determine whether there's a low probability. So here's the framework. The framework itself is quite simple. Was there an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured PHI? Do any exceptions apply? Probability threshold exceeded, right? If you if you get the right answers, then you or the wrong answers, right? Then you have to notify. That's it. So now we get to notification of stakeholders. Is about we got about 23 minutes. I'll take some questions now, uh, and we can cover more after we get through this part of it. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple slides back that the CE needs to monitor the BAs and sub-BAs. To what extent? How do you monitor? How frequently? And how to document such monitoring? Well, no, 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 that's, that, no. So let me clarify. A CE has to monitor the contract, not the operations of its BAs, okay? It's monitoring of the contract, okay? Not, it, 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 monitoring the BA the operations of a BA is an impossibility, right? That's not that's not what's meant. And furthermore, you don't have to monitor the BAs of your BAs. You only have to monitor if you're a covered entity your direct BAs. And if you're a BA, your direct BAs. Every every chain has, you know, what I mean, you go one level deep. So a covered entity uh, that is doing business with a um, a business associate that itself has a subcontractor, covered entity doesn't have to deal with the subcontractor, be responsible for the subcontractor. That's the business associate's responsibility. So that's how that works. And what you're monitoring is the contract. You can't turn uh, uh, and pretend you didn't see that the business associate is in material breach of the contract or the other way around. Business associates have to monitor the contract with their CEs and with their subs. So a BA could see that a BA may notice that a, a covered entity is in material breach. And they can't uh, turn uh, and look the other way either. So you have to be responsible for monitoring the contract. That is vague. How do you do that, right? But that's different than monitoring the contract is different than satisfactory assurances. There's a piece in the security rule that says you got to get satisfactory assurances, right? That's different 
then the monitoring section. So when we're talking about monitoring, we're talking about monitoring the contract. When we're talking about satisfactory assurances, those are weasel words that say, did you do the appropriate due diligence with this particular BA? Two, two different concepts. If you do not get a BA with a lab, how do you get assurance that they will notify you if there is a breach? That information is still belonging to the initial CE, isn't it? No, it's not. Not for the purposes of high tech HIPAA. They're a covered entity. They got to notify. If the breach happened with with breach happened with uh, information that they had under their control, they don't have to notify the other covered entity. They may they may want to, right? In the case of where you're a lab, I mean, I can see why that question arises. But no, there is no CE to CE notification requirement. That lab, if the lab got breached, the lab is a covered entity. The lab's got to notify. That's how that works. The lab would have to notify the patient, not not in let's say the primary care provider, right? Uh, recent theft of PHI in quote in uh, parentheses face sheets from our agency involves seventy clients. Is each one of those considered a violation, or is it just one breach? That's a great question, and 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 HHS has provided guidance that. Uh, in fact, each one of those is going to be considered a violation. So uh, there you have it. If you had if you had five thousand records on a phone or a, a PC, that's five thousand violations. That's why the fines can go um, really um, be really significant really fast. And that's why a lot of uh, docs and all that that think, hey, we don't have to you know this HIPAA schmipa, you know, it's no big deal. Well, it never used to be a big deal because it was an unenforced paper diagram. Now when you can get, uh, you know, easily get a $2 million fine, that will probably ruin your um, your day, you know, if, if you get whacked with that kind of fine and followed up by a class action lawsuit. So, you know, it's really incumbent on privacy officers and uh, security officers or office managers that have been given this responsibility, if for no other reason to cover your own butt, to notify um, you know, the executives that, hey, this is, you know, this, there's a new sheriff in town. This game has really changed. And that really is why breach notification is the 800-pound gorilla, because it ain't audit that's going to get you. It's a breach or a complaint. Let me, uh, let me get through a few more slides here. We'll get through the end of the slides, and we'll wrap up taking uh, questions. So there are certain things that you got to have in the notification, a description of what happened, a description of the types of unsecured PHI, steps individuals should take to protect themselves, a description of what you're doing to investigate the breach and to mitigate. Um, you must include a toll-free number, an email address, website. There are specific, you just can't notify any old way you want, right? There, no, you can't do that. High Tech 13402 says you got to have this stuff at least when you notify. <clears throat> okay, so Notice to HHS and the media where applicable. HHS always, except it's either a question of now or at the end of the year, should include information similar to what is provided to individuals. So once you get that incident document in place, that's kind of what you use to notify the individual, to notify HHS, etc. Uh, it's also going to be impacted how you notify about the quality of the contact information that you have. And we're going to look at a couple of flowcharts that deal with that. So if you have out-of-date contact information, how do you know? Well, you're just going to have to figure that out. It's greater than 10 then you can use substitute notice, website homepage, or major print or broadcast media, uh, and a toll-free number. If you're out of date, uh, contact information is less than 10, uh, substitute notice, written or telephone or other means, and a toll-free number. Otherwise, um, you know, if your contact information is good, you could notify by first-class mail or <laughs> email if the only if the individual agreed to it, right? So you're going to have to go through some analysis of how good is our contact information here. Uh, now, if there's greater than 500 individuals in a particular state, okay, so greater, so you had a breach that it was 501 individuals in Florida, then you're going to have to notify prominent media, and depending on, you know, if those individuals are scattered all over the state, prominent media may, may mean media in Tampa, Orlando, Miami, Jacksonville, who knows, right, if you're trying to cover the entire state. Now, if you know that all your patients are in the greater Miami area, well, then, you know, you wouldn't use media in the greater Miami area. Uh, if it is less, 500 or less, 
in a, in, in a given state or jurisdiction, then no media notification is required at all. Okay, this is different than the HHS. So, for example, let's say you had a breach and you had uh, 250 in Georgia and 251 in Florida. You wouldn't have to notify media in either state because you don't have greater than 500 in a, a given state or jurisdiction, right? You had 250 in Georgia, 251 in Florida. You don't meet the rules, so you don't have to notify. Now, no, with respect to notifying HHS, if you if the breach has greater than or equal to 500, then you have to notify HHS without unreasonable delay, and in no case later than 60 days. So the 60 days is, you know, you don't really want to wait that long, but you know that is the that is the last time or the last chance you get on that 60th day. Um, otherwise, if it's less than 500, then you have to notify HHS at, at, at the end of the year. So in any case, you always have to notify HHS. If you have a breach of greater than or equal to 500 individuals, you're going to end up on the HHS wall of shame. And I don't know of any, uh, that wall of shame looks like it goes on forever. I don't know how you get off that thing. Once you get on it, that information apparently will stay on there for um, ever. Um, so talked about tracking security incidents, you got to have a system in place to track security incidents or you're going to be found to be in willful neglect. Remember that security incident means an attempted or successful unauthorized access use disclosure, etc. It doesn't have to be that you know somebody actually got away with PHI. An attempt qualifies as a security incident. Information systems, you can uh, read uh, what that means. Uh, you can have a paper-based information system so it doesn't really mean that it has to be electronic. Um, obviously, you know, paper PHI systems are going to be around for a long, long time, even though um, as a nation we're trying to move to all ePHI. Let's talk a little bit about cost. Okay, so the Ponyman or Ponyman, Ponyman Institute. This is 2013 with their ninth annual survey. They, they, they do it across industries and you got, look, I treat these numbers with a you know a little bit of a grain of salt because it's it's quickly going out of um, you know business numbers. So if you had a a, a breach of uh, I don't even think that math is right, Martin. You're good at this math. I think at one hundred and eighty eight dollars, we used to use two hundred, right? At two hundred dollars, if you had a five thousand person breach, yeah, those num those numbers aren't right there. It, Right at 200, if it was 200 dollars and you had a five, I think there's a missing. Um, if if it was 200 dollars and it used to be the number that we, we would use, uh, and you had a 5,000 person breach, that's a, that's a million dollars of notification cost, and you got to you got to take into consideration all the factors that the Ponemon Institute is including in that cost. I tend to think that that the, the, those numbers are so high that that can't possibly be what is actually happening. But if we took 188 times I'm actually using my calculator here because I can't do this math in my head anymore. Math's right. That is right. Okay. All right. So it can get really high really quick. That's a five million dollar fine. You can you can fit probably three hundred thousand records on a thumb drive, so or on a laptop, millions of records. So you can see how. Uh, a, a, a theft or losing a device with PHI is going to cost you. What's the cost? It's really, really big. It's going to ruin your day if you get whacked with one of these fines. Uh, what are the implications for the law, for uh, the healthcare industry? HHS has been advocating building this cultural compliance. That's kind of feel-good language. You know, you're going to have to really dig in and get started and, and do things in a way that you haven't done them in the past. What this means in practice is, is building privacy and security compliance into your organizational DNA, into what you do that provides value for the patient. That really requires a complete rethinking of how you treat privacy and security and compliance. Okay? It's not this necessary evil. You got to sort of, if you're actually going to be successful at all in building an effective program, you got to change your organizational DNA. Uh, you can look at these five compliance strategies that are guaranteed to fail. Uh, on your own time. What you want to definitely avoid is any finding of willful neglect because that's where the impositions of the harshest fines lie. They start at uh, 
$50,000 per violation. So the quick fix, encrypt every body piece of PHI that you can. Okay, encrypt, encrypt, encrypt. And here's one for you that nobody or very few people are taking advantage of. Do not store PHI on any mobile devices. And by mobile devices, I mean pads, laptops, phones, anything that can get legs and walk. Don't store PHI locally. Mobile devices should be used as access only. Yes, there are technology vendors out there that have all this kind of great, you know, sort of they say technology that will allow you to protect it, yada, yada. And, you know, it's like a million-dollar problem, and you can avoid the whole thing by just having a policy that says mobile devices are access only. We will allow you, if you register in our mobile device program, we will allow you to access our PHI that's stored centrally, but you, we're not going to store PHI locally. And if you do, we're going to san we're going to sanction you. If you download 3,000 records on a PHI and it, you know it's on a laptop uh, that's unencrypted, then first of all, we don't want any PHI on a laptop. Second of all, our mobile program says if you have any PHI on a mobile device, if you got an exception uh, from the compliance officer, then that PHI on that mobile device better be encrypted and you solve most of the problem, okay? You got to have policies, processes, and be able to track process results in order to show visible demonstrable evidence of compliance and if you hope to ever establish a culture of compliance. Uh, it is definitely the 800-pound gorilla. It's what's going to get you if a patient complaint doesn't get you. Here's how the fines run. I'm not going to cover this other than to tell you that that million and a half is not a maximum fine. It's, you know, this really, really complex sort of scheme they came up with on how to figure this out. But it, that one million five is a yearly cap for all violations of the same provision, which means you can violate a provision in probably 20 different ways, okay? <laughs> I know it's very confusing, but so 1.5 million is not the max. These are the maxes per identical violation, okay? So if you've had, uh, uh, you know, 5,000 records in, in the breach or 500,000 records in the breach, you're probably just going to get fined a million and a half because that is the same identical type of violation. Each record, uh, HHS counts separately, but that is an identical violation. That was all one breach, but that's just the breach. What if they come in and find that you weren't tracking security incidents, you weren't doing this, you weren't doing the other? I mean, that could quickly uh, get out of hand to where they find 10, 20, 30 other violations. You can quickly get over 1.5, and like we uh, talked about earlier, Signet got fined 4.3 million uh, a few years back. So uh, there you have it. I'm not going to cover this tiers of tiers of degrees of fault, because if you're dealing with this, uh, you need counsel. Call me, and I, I will be glad to help you. Um, omnibus rule summary. You can kind of uh, read over this. You know, it is just summarizing really what what's changed. Um, the definition of breach has been amended. Uh, it, it contains those three exceptions. Go out to 164.402, look at it. Uh, it's presumed to be a breach now, so that whole uh, risk of harm is is gone. Omnibus rule did uh, did away with that. Um, you can provide notification for every breach. You know, you don't have to do this risk assessment. I mean, obviously, you probably do want some want to do some sort of analysis just because you want to gather this data, and you can expect that law, you know, class action lawsuit to be filed and. But, you know, it's not a requirement. You can notify. You don't have to do this. It, it, you only have to do the risk assessment if, if you think you, you, you're you going to try to establish a low probability. Like I said, I think as a practical matter, you do want to do these every time, but, you know, the, the law doesn't require you uh, to. Um, talked about this. The CEs and, and, and BAs have the burden of proof for low probability. Um, Minimum necessary is something you're going to hear a lot about. The, the secretary is supposed to provide more guidance, but you're going to hear a lot more about minimum necessary. If you are, if you have a business partner, business partner that's doing something with your PHI, then only give them the PHI that they need to 
perform the business function that they're performing on your behalf and not everything because it was just easier for you to give them everything. You're going to get whacked for violating the minimum necessary principle and that applies to any kind of use or disclosure. You have to keep that principle uh, in mind. Again, we talked about this. Covered entities have to uh, notify individuals. Uh, they can delegate that. Okay, they can delegate that legally, right, to a, a business associate, but that has to be a formal uh, delegation. Okay, just a shameless plug, you go out to the Survivor Buy, go to a store, we have a subscription plan that includes all our products. You can read about the ben benefits. We provide the recipe and not just the ingredients. Provide educational products. It's not software, it's wetware. Things that you can start executing on today, policies, uh, checklists, templates training, uh, et cetera. We believe in agile compliance, which means get started uh, and do something even if it's wrong. Okay, we got a few more minutes to take some more questions. Martin? Uh, first of all, Carlos, let me say we have a lot of questions on here, and I would encourage... All right, so we, 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 we don't, we're not going to get kicked off at 3.30, man. So yeah. we'll, just, we'll just go on for a while. How's that? that that's a good idea. So uh, guys, if, you guys, if you guys stay on, we'll stay on. How's that? And if they have to drop off for whatever reason, there's always ask Carlos anything on Friday. You can come back. Okay. Recent news has discussed the FTC enforcing security protections. Is there something else now that CEs and BAs have to add to the to-do list? Or if you comply with HIPAA, should you be good on the FTC side? Yeah, that's, that whole FTC thing is really confusing because F, the FTC is not regulating covered entities, okay? It, the FTC is, could regulate somebody that wasn't a covered entity that did something with PHI that was bad, and then it would fall under the FTC's uh, regulatory enforcement power, okay? But if it's a covered entity or a business associate, it's going to be OCR that regulates it. Let me give you an example that's easier to understand. Uh, if you have a personal health record like uh, uh, Microsoft Health Vault or what used to be Google Health before it went away, and that personal health record was untethered to, to from any EHR, it wasn't part of Kaiser Permanente's EHR, it was just standalone. You could go out there to Google and put in your personal health information, blah, blah, blah. Well, Google and Microsoft aren't covered entities, and if they had a breach, they would have been governed by the FTC, okay? But if you take that Microsoft Health Vault, which is the only one major player with a PHR that remains, and you bolt it on to Epic, well now Microsoft is really a business associate and any, any violation of in the PHR would be uh, governed by OCR. So the answer, the, 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 that was the long answer. The short answer is no. There's nothing additional that you have to be worried about. Unfortunately, you know, that stuff gets out in the media and then causes all that much confusion and so no you don't you don't have to worry about anything else and and the rules by the way between the FTC and OCR have been harmonized for the most part so they're working off this similar federal standards is it appropriate to send a BAA auditor to request to view the procedures to assure compliance is being followed you know, in our model contract, we say that, 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 that you know, uh, yeah, if you want to go to that extent, you know, put that in your, modify your BAA and put it in there that, you know what, if you're going to do business with us, we're going to require not only to see your uh, policy and procedures, but we want to make an on-site visit. There's nothing that prevents you from adding that kind of language into your BAA. Uh, like I said, once you've satisfied the regulatory, the regulatory requirements, it's just like any other contract. You can put any term and condition in there that both parties agree to. Do we need HIPAA training for our cleaning crew service? No, you know, we covered that. That was your cleaning crew, landscape, and all that. Yes, they come into contact with PHI, but HHS has provided guidance, and that, that, that sort of falls into the incident two uh, category. Does a practice need to have a BAA with their clearing house? Uh, you know, clearinghouse is one of the uh, three types of covered entities, right? You have three types of covered entities, a healthcare provider, 
a health plan and a health care clearinghouse. So if the clearinghouse is a covered entity, then no, you, you wouldn't. A patient is checking in at the admission desk. The clerk inadvertently hands the patient consent of another patient to sign. The person sees it, and it is not his name and hands it back. Is that a breach? Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, it's, it's you gave away the patient's name, and if you're at, you know, the whatever, uh, cancer center, then, right, you, that other person that saw that document, that consent form, probably knows that John Doe now has cancer, is being treated for cancer. That's a breach, probably. I mean, when I say probably is, I don't think that falls under, you know, was it an impermissible use or disclosure? Yes. Was it unsecured? Yes. Does it fall under one of the three exceptions? Doesn't seem to. Is it a low probability that it was compromised? Well, in that hypothetical, we just said the person noticed the name. So there you go. That's, that's the analysis. With an inadvertent disclosure, if the PHI is returned or destroyed, is it considered unusable? No, it's got to be, the only way you can consider it unusable, undecipherable, and blah, 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 is that it was encrypted to begin with. No one could ever, no one ever got access to it because it was encrypted. That's what it means to be unusable or indecipherable. That it, it doesn't matter that the PHI, that somebody returns the PHI. If they saw it, they saw it. I mean, and if they saw it, then it wasn't encrypted, because if it was encrypted, they would have never seen it. As a BA, if PHI from one CE is accidentally closed to a diff disclosed to a different CE, is that considered a breach if we have agreements signed with both CEs? Uh, that might fall under one of the exceptions, right? That would be an analytical framework, and you know, the, the both covenant entities are, are required to comply with HIPAA. They know they shouldn't disclose it. If you got it back and they say they didn't disclose it. Uh, that probably falls under one of the exceptions. Okay. Probably okay. Do now, I would I would fill out an incident document and document all that, right? But I think you know, in that case, that's what one of the exceptions. That's one of the you know would fall under one of the exceptions, and you would be good. Do incidents under the three exceptions still require documentation that the event happened? Yes, you have to log any attempt. Yes, that gets back to logging incidents. You have to log this stuff. That's like a primary requirement. And then you have to show that you did this analysis. How, how else are you going to prove that, oh, no, we did everything was cool. Oh, yeah, no, there's no documentation. But let me, let, me, let me just tell you. I'm telling you, we did it all right. It was all good. No, that's not going to work. Yeah, you got I mean, if you find that it is, un, you know, even if it's secured, mark it off. Secure, no breach, happened no state, done. File it. You're good. But yeah, by all means, yeah, you gotta you gotta document this stuff. That's that's how you have visible, demonstrable evidence of compliance. What if a paper billing statement was sent to the wrong patient? Well, that's the same hypothetical, right? Paper billing patient from you know such and such cancer center to the wrong patient, John Doe. Well, you don't know that this person knows John Doe. They're in the same community. You know, that's a breach. So, you know, it's a breach of one record, but it's a breach. Report, you got to report it to the patient. you got to report it to HHS at the end of the year. Okay. Can you discuss the difference in large data or multiple patient breach and a single document or patient breach, such as a report mailed to the wrong address or wrong patient's report sent to an outside office? Yeah, I can discuss it. It's one, the fine's going to be a lot bigger than the other. <laughs> you know, if you have just the one record, you're probably, you know, you're, you're going to get fined, but it's not going to be that, that big, you know. Uh, if you have 5000 or 10000 or 20000 that fine's going to get a lot bigger. So, you know, that's, that, that's, that's the magnitude there. You know, in those cases where it's one record, fax is someplace, yes, log it, take care of it, blah, blah, blah. You know, but that's not that's not where you're going to get killed. You're going to get killed on that laptop that has twenty thousand records and got lost and was unencrypted. A CE requested PHI to be faxed to them. 
but they gave us the wrong fax number. Are we required to notify HHS of this breach? Well, you know, you just fax, you just think about it. And all these questions, I'm trying, I'm, I'm trying to get to. You, you know, you can you can drive yourself nuts with all these hypotheticals. Go back to the framework. Answer. You can answer these questions a lot yourself. Was it an impermissible use or disclosure of unsecured PHI? What's the answer to that? It's got to be yes. You just fax some stuff to God knows where. That's not a permissible use or disclosure. Okay. Does one of the exceptions apply? Nah, it doesn't look like it applies in this case. Is there a low probability? Well, you don't even know what kind of probability because you don't know where it was faxed. And it's your burden of proof. I'd say that's breach. So you can answer these questions. They're not that you have to go through the framework, right? Go through these three questions every time, and you can you can get a pretty good feel for what the answer is going to be. If I understand correctly, a violation of the privacy rule is a security incident. If we have a violation of the privacy rule, but it is not a breach, how does the security incident response policy policy apply to this? No, a security incident a security incident could be broader is broader by definition than a, a violation of the privacy rule. They're not one and the same thing. Okay, a security incident could be somebody attempted to access to your system. If they attempted access to your system and it was encrypted. That's not a violation of the privacy rule, but it's still a security incident. Okay, so those, the security incident and a violation of the privacy rule are are uh, two different things. Yes, most violations of the privacy rule are going to be security incidents, but they're not they're not one and the same thing. So, ask me the question again. And I'll see if there's something else. I mean, I think there was a, 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 a another question buried in that. So, ask me again. On, Um, are you okay? Ask me the same question again. First of all, I just wanted to clarify that a security incident and a violation of the privacy rule are not one and the same. But I think there was another deeper question in there. So ask me again. I'll see if I can. Un unfortunately, I have moved on from that question and I have it no longer available to me. Oh, um, there you go. <laughs> okay. And there's a violation of the security rule and privacy rule right there. Is web-based technology safe for transmitting data that has been encrypted? Yeah, I mean, if you encrypt it correctly, right, using PHI, the the protocol for a PHI in motion, I mean, it's encrypted, right? That, that's what you want to do. You want to encrypt it when you're going across the wire. Uh, are there methods for encryption, encrypting information that is going to be faxed? Yeah, there's secure e-fax. Um, and I, I think um, a lot of the eFax vendors now uh, should be offering that service. So yes, there's a way to securely uh, secure fax transmissions. Um, here's the scenario. An employee emailed lab results to the wrong email address. The receiver called and we recovered the info. Info revealed was name, date of birth, uh, account number, PT. Is this a reportable breach? Well, Martin, let me, I'm going to ask you, what do you think? Yes. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> unpermissible user disclosure? Yeah. Unsecured? Yeah. Does it fall under one of the three exceptions? No. It's a breach. Okay. BA agree, agrees to a reasonable time frame for reporting a breach, but does not, does not agree to the specific time frame. Is that acceptable? In other words, uh, apparently the BA is using weasel words. Well, I mean, the BA has to notify statutorily, right, by 60 days, no later. Um, you know, you could put in the contract that, no, you know what, we want RBAs to notify us in 30 days. Now, that's not illegal. That's just another term and condition between two consenting parties that signed a contract. Okay? Just like, um, you know, uh, there's no regulatory requirement in the BAA that the, that the covered entity have access to the 
uh, VA's uh, policies, procedures, you know, yada yada. But in our model contract, we say, no, yes, you got to give us access on, upon request. You know, you have so many days to give us access to this kind of information, policies, blah blah blah. Right? It's not like you know, you put a gun at somebody's head and you know, you had five hours to give me this information. But you know, the parties can come to reasonable terms and conditions in the contract, and, and if they agree and sign the contract, then they're bound by the contract. That's the one, one of the reasons for having a contract. I, I think this this question is more for liability. Um, on faxing, if the BA got a wrong fax number from the CE, who did what? Who's responsible, I guess, is the question. Well, you know, you probably can argue about that in court. <laughs> it's only if it was only one record. Um, you know, who knows what a court's going to say on that kind of hypothetical? I, you know, you got the wrong. I'm, I'm not sure why a CE would be given a BA a a fax number, uh, but um, you know, I, I suppose if you were the BA, you're going to argue, hey, it wasn't my fault, right? It was I got it. I got the wrong BA. There's no there's no real. I mean, the jury would have to decide. That's a fact. That's a fact question. The jury would have to decide who, who's liable in that scenario. All right, let's take one more. One more. Okay. I work for an ambulance billing company. Our customer service reps takes call, take calls regarding bills, etc., and are required to ask identity verifying questions prior to discussing accounts with their callers. When I audit their notes, I find that the documentation does not state that they asked the identity verifying questions prior to discussing information. Would this be a considered a breach in an audit since no docu there is no documentation to support that the disclosure was to, excuse me, I have to scroll down a little bit more, uh, an authorized person? Would I need yeah, to treat... You know, Right. I, I mean, there's a, there's a requirement to authenticate, right? You have to you have to play the three questions game that the that the banks usually play when you go talk to them about your bank account. Uh, Mr. Leva, yeah, I'm glad to help you, but can you tell me how many accounts you have? And can you tell me what to check? You know, blah. You know, so you you ask these questions to try to authenticate. If you're not authenticating, then uh, yeah, those are probably going to be considered by an auditor breaches because you have no way of knowing who you were talking to if you didn't authenticate. Right, so authentication is one of the requirements, uh, and if you're not authenticating, if you're not authenticating, you're not documenting that you authenticated. Then, you know, the, if I were an auditor, I would find that to be a breach. So. All right, uh, thank you for listening. You guys have had great questions. Uh, AMA Fridays at three o'clock, and we're going to be doing a uh, look out for the um, March newsletter. We're going to do uh, a webinar on accounting for disclosures around the thirteenth. I think it's the second Thursday of March. So thank you very much. We're going to be emailing the slides to everybody um, in a half hour or so. Thank you.